they had powers. They had a lot of powers that would cause people around them to say, wait a minute, what's going on here? And so we knew that stuff was real. We knew spirits were real. We knew they were talking to spirits. I knew I had been seeing spirits since I was three, four, but they told me, oh, no, 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 shut that down. So we knew there was a world or worlds beyond this world, but people didn't necessarily want to talk about it too much because it's kind of uncomfortable to talk about that because it's not acceptable in the religious paradigm to talk about anything other than angels and demons. We're not going to talk about ancestors. We're not going to talk about, you know, you were talking to a spirit. We're not going to talk about you being a medium. Yet people have all these gifts and we can talk about them. And we wanted to know. Hi, Kaisi. Thank you so much for being on Shifting Dimensions today. I'm really excited to speak with you. Um, For those who are tuning in today, I'm going to be speaking with Reverend Valerie Love also known as Kaisi. Um, She is an ordained minister of spiritual consciousness who holds several initiations in the magical arts and sciences. She is the founder of the Christian Witches Mystery School, and she is also the author of 25 books on practical spirituality, magic, and the occult. Kaisi, thank you for stopping by Shifting Dimensions. It's a pleasure to have you. Oh, thank you so much for the invitation, Jumi. I'm looking forward to this conversation. It's going to be good. Yeah, it's going to be great because I think you have an amazing story and your journey is very interesting. So I want to hear about that. But I also want to hear a lot about your insights as it pertains to Christianity, the Bible, and um, also magic and witchcraft, right? Because you don't really hear all of those things in one sentence. So when I came across your profile on TikTok and, you know, binge watch a lot of your videos on YouTube, I was like, wow, this is a different way of communicating about the Bible and Christianity and what it's really about. So I really want to, you know, dig a little bit deeper with you. So thank you so much for being here today. And um, with that, I want to start again, like I said, with your story. I know that you experienced a couple of um, spiritual gifts when you were younger, but you had to shut that down and you were a Jehovah's Witness for a good amount of your life. And now you identify as a Christian witch. So could you just talk us through that story and that journey? Wow. This has been a decades long journey, as you can imagine. So I was born in Harlem, USA, New York. And growing up, we were with, I grew up in the same house as my maternal parents, my maternal grandparents. And then upstairs in the same building, and we were in the same apartment as my maternal grandparents. Now upstairs in the same building were my paternal grandparents. So there were four generations of us, of of the family, living in this tenement building, pardon me, in Harlem. And one day, probably when I was about three, four, is when my mother was out shopping. She came back. She met a Jehovah's Witness on the street corner. She talked to him for two hours. She came home, told my grandmother, I found it. I found it. My grandmother was like, no. And my mother was enthralled. She found everything that she was looking for. She had all these questions, existential questions that no one was really answering because our family was not very religious. My mother, my grandmother, of course, they had a Bible. Yeah, my grandmother was not the going to church kind. So my mother didn't grow up with that, even though we have a lot of ministers in our family. So after my mother had this experience with this gentleman, this Jehovah's Witness on the street corner, and he had the Watchtower and Awake, and he had the Bible. She started going to the Kingdom Hall. She started doing all the things that they told her to do. And the next thing you know, she found a a nice young man. He was also one of Jehovah's Witnesses. She progressed. She got baptized. She and the young man got married when I was eight. So this is years later. And when I was about three, four, just to backtrack a little bit, that's when they gave me my first Bible. When my mother went to the Kingdom Hall and, oh, we've got to get the kids the Bible and so forth and so on. My mom was single up until this time. And so when you really look at the 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 age I was when I received my first Bible, it's sort of part of me. So even as I journeyed in my spiritual unfoldment decades and decades later, the Bible was never very far from me. And it's sort of in my bones and for good reason. 
I did not know what the Bible would turn out to mean to me. Uh, I only know knew at that time what I was told. Well, when my mom got married, and uh, she and I and my little brother, the four of us, we moved into an apartment and we grew up with my father, who my mother married. Very wonderful man, very kind man. And he raised us <clears throat> just like his own. And then my mom and dad had two more kids. So it's four of us growing up together. My father of uh, biology, he was into, they say, some shady things. So he couldn't really be around us, more of as a protection. And so I didn't really know too much about his spiritual lineage yet. Later on, I came to find out through tracing my genealogy and things like that, that he was Puerto Rican. And that explained my draw to Espiritismo, which is more of a Puerto Rican spirituality and magical tradition. So it, it, put a lot of pieces into place that so much comes through the ancestral line and the bloodline as we are growing into our spirituality. It's not just this big random thing and you could just run yoga or you could just run and get this crystal or that crystal. People tend to think that this is just a big smorgasbord of spirituality when you first start going for it. Yet what I have found is that it is very ordered. It is led and guided by your higher self or your head spirit or your Arisha or whatever people call it, that there is indeed some kind of guiding force that is helping us along and that's putting in front of us the things that really will help us. Even if we don't know our lineage, it will still put our lineage in front of us. Even if we don't know our ancestors, it will still put our ancestral line and information and practices in front of us. And it will resonate because it's really who we are deep inside. And then if we are really on the path, at some point we'll say yes to it, even if we're afraid. It knows that we will eventually say yes to it. And so that was my upgrowing, uh, upbringing. Now, when I got to be teenage, I had a shocker. So I'm growing up in New York City. And for the first time, when it was time to go to high school, I actually got a little bit of distance from my family because um, I went to Washington Irving High School in New York City. It was all girls at the time. This is the 70s. And I'm meeting people from all over. I'm meeting people because New York is melting pot, right? I'm meeting people from France and from different parts of, uh, from the Caribbean and from Europe, from different countries in Africa. I'm meeting people from all over. And this is the first time that I'm attending a school that's not a neighborhood school and really close, <clears throat> pardon me, to home and sort of protected, right? That my mom could just scoot over to school at any time and be in our classes or, you know, cause she volunteered, she was very present with us. She didn't work so until much later in life. So when I went to high school, I actually had to get on the train in New York city and go all the way downtown to the village and it was, it was the first time I felt that space and I did not realize that I was crowded until I got the space. So I'm in high school and things are starting to blossom. It's the seventies, the people are burning their bras. It's the feminist movement. You know, women are standing up and doing this and that and the other. And I am starting for the first time to really look at the religion like, no, no, for the constraints. I didn't notice the constraints because I had been there since three, four years old and it was my whole life. It was, it was almost like growing up in a Mormon experience and you don't know anything else. Once I got that distance and I was in high school and I started to come into more of the arts, even though we lived in New York City, my mom was a big uh, purveyor of the arts. She always took us to museums and all these wholesome places that Jehovah's Witnesses were allowed to. Well, when I got to high school, I met a whole bunch of unwholesome stuff. You know, girls were smoking in the bathroom, you know, we, this, that, the other. And it was a whole new world. And that's where I really started to open up and, and blossom. And then my writing started to happen. So I started writing. I got promoted a lot with writing. I started writing in the school newspaper, the school sketchbook, it's called. Then my writing got published in the New York Times. And I'm thinking, 
wow, it, under great writing by young people. And I'm thinking, wow, am I going to be a journalist? I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to go for writing. And the Jehovah's Witness cult is like, no, 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 you can't go to college. Can't do any of that. No, it doesn't matter if you get scholarships, no college, none of that. Because they considered college to be this like den of iniquity with drugs and party and rock and roll and sex all the time. So that was all they saw college to be. So when I was there, they highly encouraged away from college. Pretty much it was a rule that you didn't go to college, that you got a trade. You would either go to nursing school or secretarial school, or if you were a man, you would go and become a mechanic or an electrician or a carpenter. Those were things that were acceptable. But outside of that, they really didn't go for, hey, you're going to have a career because they thought the world was going to end in 1975. So they didn't encourage you to have anything beyond just have, have enough for today, not even plan for the future. They actually used to tell witnesses or some witnesses used to do this. They wouldn't get dental work done because they would say Armageddon's coming. So it's no need for me to go and get dental work done because the end is coming. So it was that kind of apocalyptic thinking. The end could be here at any moment. I'm not going to do anything long term. So all of that really started to kind of rub me the wrong way when I was in high school. And that's where it started blossoming open. That's where the exposure started happening. I did not know what Zodiac sign I was until I was probably about 30 years old. Because they don't believe in the Zodiac. They don't believe in yoga. They don't believe in incense. They don't believe in doing anything that's expansion of consciousness. And um, it's okay if that's what people want to do. I'm not here to knock it. It wasn't for me. I knew it wasn't for me. And I could feel it deep in here. Well, because they tell you don't have friends outside of the Jehovah's Witness experience, don't hang out with people outside of this because of that. If you attempt to leave, you will have a very hard time. You'll be lonely. You won't have any people around you, no support system. So when they use ostracism as a technique for obedience, it is very powerful because it is almost like you will be left completely alone without your tribe, including your family. They will get your family to disown you in an attempt to disown you. And so that's what happened with me. I went through a dark night of the soul after I, I stayed and I, I struggled. I struggled. You know, I struggled. I got married to a Jehovah's Witness guy like they told us to do. I was 22. He was 23. And I, I'm still kind of like struggling. I'm muddling along. But I'm doing my best to say I, I'm here and I'm going to do this, you know. But all the while, there was an internal strife happening that I tried to suppress. I didn't want to deal. I didn't want to think about it. Well, we know that that cannot continue and the person be happy and fulfilled. Well, I had two children with my husband, but by now we had moved to Maryland. We had moved out of New York City just to have a better kind of life. We didn't want to raise our kids in New York City. And uh, I'm starting to have a depression. I'm starting to go into a depression. I'm starting to lose myself. And then I give birth to the baby and now I'm really like, can't move, curled up in the bed. I'm nursing the baby. I barely have the energy to get up and do anything. I have a toddler at this time and the baby. And I am just, I'm going down quick, you know? I'm going down quick. And pardon me, I forgot to turn off my, I apologize. And so because of that, it just, became a dark night of the soul experience. So right when I was coming up on that Saturn return, 28, 29, I was in a deep pit. I was in a hole and I saw no way out because everyone around me was in this thing. And I didn't, I didn't see a way out. And so I was like dead man walking. Like, I'm just going to be here forever. And it's just going to be. And so I'm in this deep, deep, deep depression. And then one day I'm laying there in the bed and the voice says, get up. And I sit up. Like, what? What was that? Right? You know the voice. Yeah. <laughs> and it said, get dressed. And I'm and it was speaking calmly and it was not demanding. It was simply get dressed. It was simply 
information. It didn't have a flavor to the information. So I got up and I got, I knew to listen, even though everything in the religion teaches you not to heed your intuition because they tell you that the heart is evil and that you should listen to the rules of the religion. So they already had programmed me somewhat away from my own inner knowing and intuition, which has to happen in order for a person to just be all in on a religion. Right. And not listen to that own inner voice. That day I was solely listening to this because everything that I had listened to wasn't working for me. And so I got up, I got dressed and then it said, go outside. And I went outside and the sun was shining. It was a beautiful day. And I stood on the porch, like, like the little, you know, stoop outside of my townhouse. We were living in a townhouse and I looked up and it, it said, breathe. And I went, and I drew in this deep breath. And when I let it go, I said, have I not been breathing, breathing this whole time? When did I stop breathing? I wasn't taking deep breaths. I wasn't breathing. I was panting through life. Like, <laughs> And so therefore we know the breath is associated with so much with healing and with connection to realms beyond the third dimension. So I breathed and said, look up. And I looked up and I saw this great big blue sky above me as something rolled off of me, like just years of obligation and heaviness. It's such a heavy religion. It's rolled off. And I'm like, whoa. And it said, walk. And I started walking, 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 and I'm breathing and I'm walking and I'm looking at the sky and something's happening. I didn't even have the words for it. Next thing you know, I start reading all kinds of books on Buddhism. Those were the first books that I could kind of go to beyond what the witnesses said. The cult said, you can't read anything outside of the books we make. And I dared, you know, like go to the bookstore <laughs> and find a book that was like, spirituality what is that I don't know we didn't have the internet none of that was going on there was no YouTube so I'm so happy now for people who can go on YouTube and hear these kinds of stories I didn't have any of that I didn't grow up with any of that and then none of that was available to me so it was all books and I had to go find the books and go to like Borders bookstore or the corner bookstore in the neighborhood and see what book I could find and then hide it well, I did that for a while. And then eventually my mom said, you know, what's going on? Because people were just the, the witnesses. They were chattering behind my back, like something's going on with her. My husband was calling my mother, like, I don't know what's going on with her. She, She's losing it. And do we need to get her some mental help? What, what, what's happening? We don't know. Call the elders, you know, the police of Jehovah's Witnesses. And for me, nothing was wrong. I was waking up. I was waking up from a huge slumber. And so I'm reading these books. And one day my mom says to me, and I'm, I'm telling her some of the things that I read in the Buddhist book. And mom says to me, Val, you know, that's the devil, right? I said, what, what do you mean? She said, you know, that's Satan, the devil. I said, mom, there's no way. Because I was reading the book, the Buddhist books, the spirituality books. They were feeding me. I was resonating like, yes, yes, yes. This is what I've been looking for. And it couldn't be the devil. And mom said something that made me know I could not talk to her about this. She said, well, Val, you know, that's how the devil gets you by making you think that it's not him. He's blinding you. And when she said that to me, a calm came over me. And I simply said, oh, I'm not going to be able to talk to you about this. And that was somewhat a uh, bitter pill to swallow because my mother and I were like this. Then when I got this fellowship, it was kind of one divide. And then now we're having more and more divides. We're just on different paths. And we were like that for many years. When she was on her deathbed, she released her body in 2013. And she was on her deathbed. And I was there at all our family, all of us. And I sat down and we talked. And we talked. And we cried and we talked about how much we love each other. And we, we mended it, we healed it before she dropped her body. And then she dropped her body not long after that. And so that was sort of how I 
came into it, how I went through it. And I came to the realization that it was perfect for my mother. It was her thing. It worked for her. It didn't work for me. So I had to go out and forge my own path. And I did. And it is the best thing I could have ever done. If I was still in the code, I'd call, I'd be dead or in the hospital. Wow. You know, your story is so remarkable. And even before I even talk about that, I think it's interesting that you're not necessarily saying the religion is bad, which is something I admire about you. Every single thing, every single thing that I've listened from you, you are always kind of speaking from your perspective and what works for you and what your experience was like, but not necessarily um, invalidating other people's experiences that, you know, may have found that path to work for them on their spiritual journey. So I think that's a good thing that I wanted to highlight, but also just hearing your story and how you were in a essentially what felt like a system that was pushing you away from what was authentic and true to your own soul's calling and your own soul's evolution and getting to the point of having this dark night of the soul and being told to get up, literally wake up almost. Um, and when you talked about that voice, I know exactly what you're talking about because when I'm talking to people and I'm like, you know, when my intuition is talking to me, it's a matter of fact. It's not, there's no emotion tied to it. It's just, I, like you said, it's a factual voice. It's just kind of like, this is what it is type of thing. Um, so when you were saying that, I really resonated with that. Um, so again, your story is so remarkable. And when I came across your um, your work and I saw Christian Witch, and I also read that you had been a Jehovah's Witness, my initial thought was, you know, is this a sort of like a rebellious title? Because you know how sometimes people go through something and then they they take ownership of a word because it's like, if people are going to think what I'm doing is evil or they're going to have certain ideas about it, then you know what? I'm going to wear that title with honor. So when I first came across that title, because when you think about Christian and witch in societal standards, it's like a paradox. Those two things don't go together. They're on two opposite ends of the spectrum, right? So again, I was like, oh, is this like a rebellious title? So how did you kind of, come into the fact that you were a witch? Because I think you said something about your journey um, that as a young person, you hadn't fully come to terms that the truth of your nature was that you were a born witch. So when did you realize that you were a witch or why did you decide to embrace that title and still hold on to your Christian title? Excellent question. I found out because I read a bunch of witch books and I said, well, I do that. Oh, well, I do that. <laughs> it was, and there were no Christian witchcraft books at all. And as I, before I came to the understanding of being a Christian witch, I had to first even get clear on what a witch is, which I was not clear on. I only knew what they told me in the religion. The religion of, oh, it's horrible, it's bad. Thou should not suffer a wish to live, you know, all the things that they tell you. And and they never gave me a concrete reason why. They never gave me anything beyond, well, it's in the Bible. They never gave me a well thought out argument about it or a case for it. They never gave me any life examples of why one would not want to do that. So for me, it was a flimsy argument. It didn't hold water or weight. And when I began this journey of reading all these books, that's why I say when your soul wakes up, it's kind of ravenous. It starts going for all these books, yes? So I started reading the books and I noticed that when I would go to Borders, this was when Borders was still open in the United States, and Barnes and Noble. First, I was in like the Christian inspiration section, like I would read T.D. Jakes and things like that. And then I went deeper into spirituality and I would start seeing some things like uh, intuition and some Doreen virtue and things like that. Then I would go deeper and I saw these books on witchcraft and Scott Cunningham and the, you know, the angels and uh, the elements and whatnot. And I was just like, yes, yes, yes. I want all these books, you know, so I would read them and read them and read them in Barnes and Noble because I couldn't take them home because the people that were around me were still people that were deep into religion. So finally broke away from the religion. And when I broke away from the religion, I went into my hedonistic phase and I feel like everyone who was in some kind of strict experience 
probably would benefit from going to the other polarity because that's what I did. It was all sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I didn't care about anything. When I say drugs, I don't mean like, I was never really a person that was really into cocaine or things like that because I don't like substances that much. But I would drink whatever I wanted to drink. I would go out, I would party. I would sleep with whomever I wanted to sleep with. It was no holds barred. It was the rebellion phase. It was the phase of, I'm going to do everything they told me not to do, just to see. And I did all of that. And you know, I said, well, that's not it either. So not doing anything wasn't it. And all the way at the other polarity, doing everything you want anytime you want is not it either. So it must be true what the Buddhists are saying, that it's the middle way. It, it must be true that we do require discipline as human beings and we require freedom. And so how can we have both? How can we integrate a path that is, yes, disciplined, it's principle-centered, it, you have character, you have pride in yourself and respect in yourself. And you still have freedom to express yourself in ways that are really fulfilling for you. And as Nelson Mandela said, that we ought to express our freedom in ways that don't infringe upon the freedom of other people. And so we, we get to be free, right? We get to try things. This is a big planet with a lot of things that we can try. So try yoga. Maybe it'll work for you. Maybe it won't. At least you'll know. So uh, when I got to the place where I was done with the hedonism phase, okay, that's not it. And that's when I really doubled down on the study. And studying led me to witchcraft, the occult, couldn't stay away. It was like this, like a magnet, couldn't stay out of magic shops, in metaphysical shops, looking at wands, had crystals by now, a tarot deck. I was so afraid to even touch a tarot deck. I got into all of that and it was home for me. It was home. So I first came to the remembrance that I was a witch and that I had been a witch in many lifetimes. And I had to get there by understanding what a witch is and what a witch does and seeing the resonance. I saw myself in all those books. Then when I started reading hoodoo books, I said, oh, well, my grandmother does that. Because my grandmother, when my mom got married to my father when I was eight, we now in got introduced to, you know, during the time that they were courting and dating and whatnot, probably when I was about seven, six or seven is when I was introduced to his side of the family and his side of the family was from Georgia. And so his mother, my grandmother on my stepfather's side, my grandmother uh, on that side, she was completely a witch. And I say that in the most wonderful way possible, she had a remedy for everything. She grew things in her garden. She was a kitchen witch. She knew how to cook. And she did all these strange things that we didn't really know what she was doing. Later on, I found out it was hoodoo. You know, the salt and and, and throwing the dishwater at the sun. And the all, there were so many things that a lot of my grandmothers were doing that even my husband, when I got married the second time, his mother, when she was on this planet, all of these beautiful women are now ascended in spirit realms. When his mother was on the planet, she had some interesting rituals that she would do with brand new babies and no one knew what they were. So we may have been seeing magic, witchcraft, occult practices in our family all along, right alongside the church. All these things were practiced right alongside by good church going people. Yet we didn't know that they were witchcraft and hoodoo or magic because we didn't know witchcraft, hoodoo, and magic. And they never said that they were doing witchcraft, hoodoo, or magic. Yet they were. And they could do some powerful things and they could tell the future and they would have a dream. Oh, I dreamed about fish. Oh, this one is pregnant. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. And then find out that one's pregnant. And they could tell the future and they could. They had powers. They had a lot of powers that would cause people around them to say, wait a minute, what's going on here? And so we knew that stuff was real. We knew spirits were real. We knew they were talking to spirits. I knew I had been seeing spirits since I was three, four, but they told me, oh, no, 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 shut that down. So we knew there was a world or worlds beyond this world, but people didn't necessarily want to talk about it too much because it's kind of uncomfortable to talk about that because it's not acceptable in the religious paradigm to talk about anything other than angels and demons. We're not going to talk about ancestors. We're not going to talk about, you know, you were talking to a spirit. We're not going to talk about you being a medium. Yeah, people have all these gifts and we can talk about them. And we wanted to know. 
So fast forward to how I became a Christian witch. That gives you a little background. In October of 2011, after I had been through intensive spiritual practices, I had been ordained as a minister of spiritual consciousness by this time. I had been through some initiations. I had had a YouTube channel already for several years. The inspiration said, tell your story. I said, oh, okay, I can tell my story. So I get up, I get dressed, I put on my little makeup and whatnot, you know, I get ready for the camera to film this YouTube video. And I'm talking in YouTube video about how I was a Christian and coming out of Jehovah's Witnesses and so forth and so on. And as I'm talking, I hear myself say, Christian witch had never heard the term before in my life. Had never thought of it before in my life. I tell people all the time, I didn't make it up. I tapped into something that was already there. When the video was over, and I just keep going because I'm caught up in, in just flowing in the spirit, right? I end the video and I sit there like, what was that? Christian witch that I'm talking to my spirit team. Oh yeah, y'all think you're gonna, no, 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 I'm not doing this. I'm not gonna, I already got killed a couple of other times. No, that was a little fearful me. Like, no, I'm not doing that. There was something bigger the bigger me, the love me, the powerful me that had been fed by all those years of spiritual practice, right? In Christianity, we would call it your spirit man or your spirit woman, right? Your spirit man is bigger than your human self. And I pushed upload on that video. I said, oh my goodness, the Christians are coming for me now. Sure enough, the Christians, how I became a Christian, which was what I named it. And I just went to bed. I said, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if I just ended my life again. <laughs> it's over for me, probably. Well, it was a good life, you know? And, oh my God, you're going to hell. <laughs> you know, all this rancor, which I can understand how it came about because I was still in deep fear myself. A Christian witch? What is even a Christian witch? I don't even know what a Christian witch is. Is there such a thing? And as I kept talking about it, someone in the audience in the comments said, hey, you know, there was a book about being a Christian witch. I said, what? I went, it was the only book. And I have to give props and respect to this sister, Adelina St. Clair, because Adelina St. Clair wrote a book called The Path of the Christian Witch. It was the only book I had ever seen about being a Christian witch. I was shocked. I was like, you mean this is a thing? She had written a book about it. It was the only, I, now I had never heard the book until after I started talking about Christian witches. And then at some point, someone said, oh yeah, there's a book about that. I was shocked. I went on Amazon, there was the path of the Christian witch. What, you mean somebody else has is having this same experience and called it the same thing? So then I knew, oh, I'm not alone. Oh, I tapped into something. Next thing you know, in between all of the, you know, Christians saying, oh, you're going to hell, but Ron, no such thing, you can't be a Christian witch. In between all of that, where people are saying, I thought about that. Well, I'm a Christian and I have crystals. Well, I'm a Christian and I wanted to learn tarot. Well, I'm a Christian and I'm a medium. All of these beautiful beings who did not want to give up their relationship with Christ or their Bible or their church family because they were now going to also embark on magic, the occult, witchcraft, and secrets, ancient secrets that have been in the mystery schools for millennia. People thought they didn't go together. They actually go together as far as gum says, like peas and carrots. That is funny. Okay. There's so much to say there, but I want to make sure I fully understand, right? Because I, what I keep trying to understand is the word witch, like what makes someone a witch, right? So you have people who are psychic mediums and who read tarot, but may not necessarily identify as witches. You have people who talk about spells and all of the, those types of work and they identify as, as witches. So how would you define what it means to be a witch because I, I hear so many people have different definitions of that and then how does Christ play a role in in your journey like where does the Christian part of it come in because I know that you kind of 
did, did a deeper dive into the Bible, studying the Bible, God, and, and really and truly what Christ consciousness is. So that's like the second part of the question, but I, I want to really fully understand what you would consider to be, who you would consider to be a witch. Okay, it's an excellent question. For my experience of life, a witch is a wise woman, a wise person, doesn't have to be a woman. There are many men that are witches. A wise person, wise in the ways of a craft and healing. A witch is also a teacher, a leader, a way shower. And a witch is also a keeper or a tender of nature and an observer of cosmic events, seasons, and cycles. So to put it in a very simplified term, for me, one of the books that I read said a witch is born and not made. And that really resonated with me. And it said that you can have all the accoutrement of a witch. If you're not a witch in here, that's what I think it means. I don't think it means like you have to be born a witch. You know, I don't make any rules around it. I think it means that if you're not like to your core in here, knowing you're a witch, yet you have all the accoutrement, you see people with wands and this and that those outer things can't make you a witch. And if you know in here you're a witch, not having those things doesn't unmake you a witch. So it is very much an inner knowing. And I put this in all my books on witchcraft that you know, you know within yourself, what keeps people out of their knowing is fear of the word witch. It has a negative connotation. People don't want to be a witch because a witch is considered the enemy, a harmful person, a doer of misdeeds, uh, crimes against humanity. And that was all carefully orchestrated when the Catholic Church took over. And even over the years, it, there's been a careful orchestration to demonize all healers that are coming from naturopathic, even up until this day, demonizing naturopathic healers that would tell you to get sunlight. Oh, no, 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 you need to put sunscreen on. Well, let's hear from them as well. Okay, so we heard from the camp of you need to put sunscreen on all the time. And if that works for you, do it. I would also like to hear, okay, what does the sun do for my health and wellness from naturopathic doctors? So there has been a, I believe, a an intentional misrepresenting of those who engage in healing arts that are not the mainstream. And when you go to a witch, she might use a twig, a branch, a leaf, cinnamon, pepper. We have all manner of things at our disposal from nature and beyond to create energetically to create magic and effect a change. And we're not afraid to use it. Witches will use that. We'll use it all. Mm. So it's got to be in here that you're a witch. It's a knowing, first of all. Okay. So it also kind of sounds like any sort of practice that taps into the spiritual parts of us that's not necessarily guided through a religious dogma. That's also kind of what it sounds like potentially, because you said that, yes, you can use, you know, um, the tree leaves and you can use all of these different tools, or you could just not necessarily use those things, but kind of move or think in a way that's quote unquote, witch like, so that it makes me think of people who don't necessarily think the way think the same way of the church, for example, or any sort of like religious entity is that an understanding or is that an oversimplification of what you're trying to say? I think that is very accurate that it's not in an outward expression. It's not an outward tools. It's an inner game. Being a witch, first and foremost, you've got to know you're a witch, number one. And then you've got to know that that's what you are going to live in the world. And that's all done on the inside. Some people can't even accept. Some people are witches. They have powers and they have a draw to magic and they want to go that path. Fear holds them back. They would never call themselves witches because they're afraid. 
mm. because of the demonization of the witch. Right. Uh, There's something. I have to let that go. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to quote something that you said. You said the determining factor in what comes up for us when we hear the word witch is consciousness. One person is ecstatic about the possibilities of magic while another is stricken with terror, mostly due to the ignorance and misinformation and not from actual personal experience with witches and or magic. So that's something else that you've mentioned as well. But then I think about, you know, people who because when you talk about spells right that's one thing that scares people right because we've seen or I've seen and a lot of people have seen like for example on YouTube there are people who are like ex witch returns back to the church and this person gets online and they're like well I used to cast spells on people like if I wanted someone to fall in love with me I would do certain things to make them fall in love with me um, or I would do certain things to try to hurt people so they kind of speak about taking away the free will of somebody else or kind of using their power to um, exert control of other people and that's what a lot of people hear when they hear about you know witchcraft or like voodoo um, I'm you know being Nigerian growing up in the church as well every time people would talk about witchcraft every time I would watch a movie every time somebody was practicing what looked like witchcraft it was always to do something evil um so essentially are there people who can use witchcraft or use their gifts for evil and, and what are your thoughts on that yes there are people that do that because every human being has choice on how they're going to use anything I could pick up a hammer and I could use it to build a house or I could use it to knock somebody in the head. So all of it is intention. Everything in the universe is intention. What is my intention in doing what I am about to do or in saying what I'm going to say? Give you an example. Someone might go out tonight to a club and they'll dance and have fun and they'll say, who can I get to sleep with me so that they'll take me to dinner? Or is it, they have an ulterior motive, right? They want someone or they want to get some money out of someone. They want to get something out of someone. And so they're using sex. Their intention is I need to get something out of someone and I can get it out of them by sex. Another person may say, I'm going to go ha hang out in the club tonight. And hey, if I make a match, we'll have fun tonight. And then that'll be that. Now, both of these people may do the exact same thing. They may go out tonight and have sex with someone or a few someones. What determines what you yourself are going to experience? Your intention. Because intention is an energetic force that goes forward even before you. Because you made up in your mind what you wanted to do, right? Before you went and did it. So you made up in your mind what you wanted to do consciously or unconsciously because many people are acting out of unconscious intentions. And then we proceed forth to do that thing. And then, because the law of the universe is cause and effect, we can't get away from the results of our choices. It's coming back. Today, next year, five years, it's coming back, right? Therefore, what I experience is going to be a match, an energetic match to the intention I set down. And so when you think of it from the perspective of a Wiccan, right? Now, I'm not Wiccan. I read many books on Wicca, and I really honor people who follow that path. And, and, and it's a beautiful path for the people that love it, right? In Wicca, they have what's called the threefold rule or the, the sort of like... Um, it's part of the Wiccan read, I believe is what they call it, that whatever you do comes back to you three times. So you don't find witches in Wicca sending out something unless they're ready to get the brunt of it times three. Not saying that they don't do hexes, I don't know. People are free to do whatever they want. What I do know is this, that this universal intelligence, the infinite consciousness that brought us all forth, didn't make anyone a victim to anyone else. So while people can do spells and hexes and whatnot, the Bible says, yeah, 10,000 may fall at your right here, won't come nigh you and your household, right? That you still have choice as to how you're going to live your life. So you can put out great intentions. You will not be subject to someone else's evil intentions. 
people can have whatever intentions they want. You're living out your own intentions and your own choices. Yet the reason that a lot of spells do work on people, hexes, curses, all that work is because people are afraid of them. And the fear opens up. Uh, means if you're afraid somebody's gonna put a spell on me, I think somebody jinxed me. I think somebody hexed me. I think somebody cursed me. They probably did. And it's working. Because we can't say these things don't work because it's energetic. Yet, if I don't have that fear and I'm not operating in that level of consciousness, I'm operating in a sovereign consciousness. Sovereignty means that you own yourself and you own your consciousness. And the only thing that can come near you is your own consciousness. So what is your consciousness? And what is your consciousness a vibrational match for? Because that's what you're experiencing. So we don't need to be afraid of somebody over there throwing hands. Oh, you don't do this. I'm going to start throwing some hands. Throw hands you like. You know, all you like. I'm going to put you in the freezer. Freezer spell. Go right ahead. Because I know what I'm putting forth. And your life issues forth from inside of you, not from outside. We're not living the life from the outside in. And, and the creator, great source where we all come from, did not make us victims to other people. That's not the way this whole system works. Yet you will find people that their fear, ignorance, misunderstanding, will cause them to fall victim to people who are practitioners of the dark arts. There are practitioners of the dark arts. I'm not one of them. There are practitioners of that. The other thing I want to say about this too is there's a healing component. When you are doing magic, witchcraft, the cult, the way I teach it in the mystery school, this is a path of ascension. This is a path, not just let me do a spell so I can get some more money. Let me do a spell so I can make somebody fall in love with me. No. We do magic and witchcraft to create a wonderful environment for us to ascend our souls. Get a beautiful home by the beach so you can ascend your soul. Everything is about going up, right? Ascension, evolution. Because when you evolve, when you become a bigger person, everything in your life reflects that. So we don't need to do a spell on each individual thing, even though you can do that. There's something, I'm not saying anything's wrong with that. People can do whatever they like. Our focus is more on growing into that person, evolving and ascending into the kind of person that manifests these kinds of things, right? If I grow into being a more loving person, I will have a life full of love and with more loving people around me. Not to say I won't ever run into hate. It could happen. I'm talking about the overall flavor of it will be loving because that's what I am. And we can choose what we want to be. So let's go to the healing part of it. When you begin to heal your consciousness and you begin to forgive and you begin to accept, hey, everything in front of me is a lesson. You don't want to throw hands and try to get revenge. For what? I needed that lesson, whatever the lesson is. Yeah, you can put up boundaries, you can put up protection, but what am I needing protection from? Because nothing is going to come and get me from the outside. I'm living my life from the inside out. So when we begin to heal our consciousness and come into oneness, the great oneness, universe, there's nothing against you. The problem is our own mind. I've never seen a devil yet. I have no evidence for a devil. I do have evidence for us having thoughts and issues in consciousness that cause us to make improper choices. I've done it myself. And then all we can do is correct. So this is really a spiritual path of becoming a better person, your best that you can be. And that's what a witch is about for me as well. Wow, that was very interesting. Um, it's interesting that you distinguish between Wicca and witchcraft. I thought they were interchangeable. Are those two different things? I think that for me, they are two different things. There are Wiccans who will tell you that Wicca is witchcraft. And that they're very clear on if you are to be a witch and you're going to practice witchcraft, you're going to come in to that. You're going to get the initiations. You're going to follow the lineages and so forth and so on. And there are people that hold that. And I've read books about that and I, I honor them and respect them because that's their uh, stance. My stance is there's so many witches all around this planet. Some of them have been initiated. Some of them have never been initiated. And I promise you, they could probably brew a tea and help you heal your skin. They could probably speak some words over you. Never had an initiation, never went to a coven, 
never read a book about witchcraft. They were born doing this stuff. Their mother told them, do this, do that, the other. They're probably practicing witchcraft and don't even know it's witchcraft. They're healing people. So I operate outside of rules. And people may think that that is anarchy or chaos, and it is not. Because what I pay very close attention to are principles, the principles that work for everybody, responsibility, discipline, accountability, things like that, that are that make us live a principle-centered life the best we can. Nobody's perfect at it. And law, according to the seven hermetic laws of the universe, you know, law of cause and effect, law of mentalism, law of vibration. So I work on universal laws. And as far as I have found, the universal cause of all that is source doesn't have rules. You have to do this. You don't have to do this. You, you have to, have to, have to. It doesn't have that. It has the way the universe operates. And if you operate according to the laws of the universe, you will prosper. And if you operate against the laws of the universe, you will not. It's that simple. And karma helps us navigate that, what we get back. Mm. For the people who are listening who don't know what Wicca is, is Wicca... Would you describe Wicca as the use of dark magic? No, definitely not. I would term from all of the books that I've read on Wicca and, and many of the practitioners that I know, it is simply a form of witchcraft that is actually a religion. Wicca is mm. actually a religion and it has religious protection in the United States and it has a clergy. It has wicked priests and priestesses. And if you are in the military, you can absolutely have uh, someone come, a priest, or just like anyone, a Catholic would have a priest come and uh, help them uh, spiritually. And when a person dies in the military, they can actually have the pentacle on their tombstone, just like one person may have a cross, a wicked person. So Wicca is actually a religion practiced oh. by millions of people. It's a witchcraft. Oh. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. That's that's very interesting and almost um, slightly ironic based on just hearing your journey and I, how I hear other people talk about witchcraft and kind of having the sense of freedom to be in their spiritual or personal power without being tied to a specific do dogma. So I didn't know that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, another thing before we kind of get to the Christ part of it and the Bible piece of it, you mentioned the word initiation. And I've heard that a couple of times when people are, when they're talking about coming into their spiritual powers and embracing it, they talk about going through different initiations. From my understanding, initiations are when you're being called to dig deeper into something or embrace something and you taking the call or answering the call to go deeper into that thing, that might be you being initiated, for example, but I could be wrong. So I want to hear your perspective on what it means to be initiated into something. I like that, how you put it, that there is a calling, you answer the call, and then there is some formal entrance into the training and there is preparation. And usually it happens in some kind of passing on of that magical power or that energy through a line of people who kept that energy and passed it on to the initiate. So in addition to, yes, I'm going to start out on something, there's usually a preparation for the initiation that goes according to a very specific protocol. So as we know, if you're going to be initiated into Yoruba, that's a very specific protocol. I've been to a Bimbe, and so we know that a lot that goes on with that, even though we can't know everything that goes on with that, because much of it is private. And then if you're going to be initiated into Wicca, there would the same thing. It's a year and a day. So you would go through a process. So initiation is a preparation. It is a process. And it is also a boost, almost like a rocket boost into the thing that you're going to do. Because to be an initiate, you must be committed. Other people are casual. Initiates can't be casual because of what they call the trials of initiation that will be exacted upon you. You're going to have to do certain things. 
I was talking to a friend of mine who is in our community. She's an Akan priestess from Ghana. And um, part of her initiatory rights for the year was that she could, they can't use um, utensils. They had to eat with their hands for an entire year to teach certain lessons. All of the weird, strange looking things that people do during initiation instills in the initiate the appropriate mental attitudes for them to carry this lineage or to practice this thing. So it's all designed for a very specific purpose. In our initiations for Christian witches, we have very specific protocols. It is a blood initiation. And we do blood initiation because in the Bible, blood is sacred. Blood means something, right? Blood even means something to this day that people know that when you make a blood pact, you can't get out of it, right? Even in magic, when you make a blood oath, you can't break it. So it is to instill upon the initiates the depth the breadth and the seriousness of what you're embarking on. So casual people wouldn't do that because why would they? You know, right. Okay. Who wants to do all that if you if you don't have to or you're not called to it or you don't want to. Right. And as you were talking to, I was thinking about you know how people get called to give their life to Jesus and they get baptized and they go underwater and they come out of it and that symbolizes that they've they've been baptized and they've given their life to Jesus. So would that be considered initiation? Um, would it also be considered initiation? Cause I know for in the Catholic church, for example, uh, that we, we symbolically take the body of Christ and the blood of Jesus um, during communion as well. Is that a form of initiation or just trying to, give examples that people could, you know, relate to in, in their own religious practices as well. Yes. So I love what you say about the baptism because baptism is a water initiation. So you die. And then when you rise, you're new in Christ, right? The communion, Holy communion would be more considered a ritual because it is done on a ritualistic basis, it is done at regular intervals. Now your initiation, you're not gonna do the same initiation over and over and over again, right? You don't have to be baptized over and over and over again. You did it once and that was, a, like you said, a symbol. And it was a commitment. When we went under that water and came back up, we were committing to something. And they told us before we did it, what we were committing to. We were committing to a life of Christ. And so I remember one time I was having a conversation with Christ, you know, how you're, you're in your meditation, you're in these realms and you're speaking, you could commune with any of these non-corporeal beings. I was communicating with Christ and Christ said, well, you don't have to forget, you don't have to give up your Bible and, and, and me, Christ, just because you remembered you're a witch. And that was so mind blowing because they told me that Christ didn't like witches and Christ is telling me something different. Mm. You know, it's yes. And, and, and I, I can't wait to dig into all of that. I know we've been going on different uh, tangents, but it's just also fascinating because, you know, when I think about initiations, for example, like you said, you know, within your Christian, um, which is mystery school, part of it, part of the initiation is like a, a blood initiation. But then I think about the fact that, sometimes as people evolve through their spiritual journey, they go down different paths, right? So won't an initiation, a, a blood initiation, for example, kind of like lock someone into a system, right? Because it not that kind of taking away some sort of agency or freedom to kind of change your mind if you want to? So I'm just curious as to, what is the purpose of being initiated? Because should it even matter if someone is practicing something or they feel drawn to something? Do they need to do certain things to feel, feel like they are embodying what they're trying to do? Like you said, like some people might practice witchcraft with certain things and other people might not practice it at all, but feel it within themselves. There is um, a story that could perhaps provide a really good answer to this really good question. So let's say that you're going to a temple and let's say it's a temple to a goddess. Let's say it's Inanna, okay? And you have an outer courtyard of the temple 
where anyone can come. All kinds of people can come. They can leave offerings. They can pray. And then you have an somewhat of an outer courtyard. So it's a little closer to the goddess. The goddess is in the center. It's a little closer to the goddess. Yet, it's not all the way there yet. Yet, these are people that maybe are growing in their devotion to the goddess. And then you have the inner what they would call the most holy in the Bible, where only the high priest could go once a year. You have that inner sanctum of the goddess where the actual presence of Inanna is. Only her priestesses can go in there. No one else can go in there. Those are the only ones that can tend to the presence. They can mediate, they can come and share things with other people. Yet all the people that were in that outer courtyard, they can't come all the way to the center where the presence of the goddess lives. And that's what initiation does. It gives you access to what initiates, non-initiates do not have access to. Not to be better. I don't want to convey that at all. To serve. So in the Christian Witches Mystery School, when a person is initiated as a priestess, a high priestess in our temple, it is to serve humanity. You are now saying, just like I was ordained as a minister of spiritual consciousness, I'm not going to ever go back on that. I'm not going to ever not be a minister. And it took four years. I might change some of my thoughts about ministry. So though it was an intensive four years for me to be prepared and trained and, and to be consecrated and ordained, as a minister of spiritual consciousness to become Reverend Valerie Love took years. And just like many uh, pastors who go to divinity school, they may be there for four years. Well, when you come out of that, it's not that I'm locked into something because I went through it. It's that I intensified and deepened my commitment to my choice. I chose it. And now I'm going to walk it out. And I've got this energy with me. I've got the, the tribe with me, who, whatever initiatory path I'm in is with me. I've got tools. I've got training. I've got understanding. And the way that we know that initiations don't lock people into anything is because there are people who have multiple initiations with different magical uh, traditions and they feed each other. They help each other. My initiations make me more broad in my scope and understanding of magic and the occult. Thank you for breaking that down. And I think that's a perfect segue into talking about your relationship with Christ, right? Um, how do you feel about Christ consciousness and Jesus Christ as this holy and spiritual figure? And I, I'm hoping that once you we talk about that, we can move closer into the Bible and what your newfound thoughts on the Bible since, you know, moving away from Jehovah's Witness. Yes. So for me, Christ is a universal current of energy. It is beyond a person. So when we talk about Christ consciousness, we are talking about tapping into a universe current of energy that anyone can tap into. And the energy really is about pure unconditional love and oneness, acceptance of all people and forgiveness. It's really an ascension current. So in the universe, there's all kinds of currents of energy, right? We live in this big energetic universe. We didn't know that microwaves were zipping all around until we discovered microwaves. We didn't know that radio waves were zipping all around until we discovered radio waves. And I do intuit that perhaps in the future we'll discover spiritual waves, waves that people are sending out of telepathy. We might discover all of that maybe one day. Until then, the best we can do is meditate, 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 meditate. I've been meditating for decades. And in that meditation, the universe begins to open up. And in the opening, we understand that this is all energetic and that this is far beyond a man who may or may not have walked the planet 2000 years ago, because there are people that actually argue for, he's not a historical figure. And there are some people say, yes, he was a historical figure. And neither one can prove or disprove he was actually a historical figure. And so I am not tied to their having to have been 
a historical figure because that figure, great teacher as he was, which I consider the original Christian witch, right? Great teacher as he was, great energy wielder, absolutely powerful, absolutely in his knowing of oneness with the source. If he didn't exist historically, that would not, not in any way destroy Christ's consciousness. Christ's consciousness was in existence before he came here. He wasn't born Christ. He became a Christ. And we're all seeking to become Christ. What is Christ? It's simply an ascended being. And can we ascend? Can we all become Christ? And it has nothing to do with a religion. Okay. So I've heard people say Christ consciousness a lot, right? They talk about Christ consciousness, embodying Christ consciousness. To a lay person listening to this, what would you describe as Christ consciousness? And that's a big question, right? So what are some characteristics of Christ consciousness that you feel that we all need to embody? And like you said, it's it's less about the historical figure and more about the, the energy or the movement behind that consciousness and really embodying it. I can put it in one word, oneness. Oneness. Oneness is Christ consciousness because he didn't see an other if we go according to the stories that we've heard, right? He said, you and I are one, just as I and the Father are one. He taught oneness and that the kingdom of heaven is within you. You are one with the one. And there's only one thing happening in this entire universe, and that is consciousness. That's it. And we are all consciousness. And this consciousness has a flavor. And the flavor is love. And I don't mean love as in pandering, let you do anything you want to do. No, I'm talking about the creative energy of this entire universe that created it and sustains it. That is love. And that every being is love. That's Christ consciousness. And we could call it Buddha nature. We could call it different things. Yet, it is the knowing of oneness. We're not separate. Therefore, that would cause me to follow the golden rule, do unto others as I would have done unto me. It would cause me to turn the other cheek. It would cause me to lay down my arms like he told Peter after, you know, live by the sword, die by the sword. You got your sword ready. And then he healed the, the soldier's ear, according to the story, who came to arrest him. Like, you need to lay down your arms. You need to not be fighting. Who are you fighting? You're fighting yourself. And it's not who we're fighting. We're fighting ourselves. Nobody is here fighting me. And in my mind, I'm having battles. Sometimes I catch myself. I don't know if anybody watching this can um, relate. Sometimes I catch myself having arguments with people that are not even there. And I say this, and then they say that. <laughs> it's like, and then I catch myself, what are you doing? What are you doing? They're nowhere near. They're probably having a wonderful dinner somewhere. Not even thinking about me. <laughs> not making myself crazy. Why? No, that's not Christ consciousness. So for me, Christ consciousness is very simple. It's oneness. It's unconditional love. And it's knowing who we are, that we're from the infinite source consciousness, not a God that lives in the sky. You are it. I am it. Everyone's in it. Wow. That's how I feel. Um that's how I've always felt in, in general about things that when I was younger, didn't really have the words for Christ consciousness, but I used to struggle with understanding why people didn't like people who look like them or why people would be going to war. Like I understand human anger and all of that stuff and, you know, different motivations for, for that. But I've always kind of you know how people say God is love or it, everything's about love, not to sound cliche, but genuinely, I, I think to your to the point of oneness, right? Like we are different in this physical plane, but at the same time, there's really no separation, right? And when we believe that we're separate from one another, I think it gives us the push or validation or feeling right in hurting ourselves, like hurting each other and um, trying to double down on, on how different we are and kind of going into some sort of mania when we come across people who think or approach life differently than we do because it, we're trying to preserve what we consider to be true. Um, 
and preserve like and validate our own beingness but in order to validate our own beingness we must validate others even though we can't necessarily see their perspective so i i like how you broke that down um now i want to talk about the bible okay I've been itching to talk about the bible because i know yeah, that let's do it you you know being a jehovah's witness you had a certain perspective perspective on the bible right you were kind of told what to believe from the Bible, then you have your experience, you restudy the Bible and you're like, wait a minute, the Bible is, is not about God. And when I saw that, when you said that, I was like, <laughs> what is she talking about? Let's, let's talk about that. You also say there are two gods in the Bible. So let's, let's start there. Why do you say the Bible is not about God? And why do you say that there are two different gods in the Bible? Yes. So First, we could tell, even if we don't go too deep, that the the God Jesus is talking about and the God of the Old Testament are two different beings. Because Jesus is talking about this very loving father, very uh, compassionate, uh, forgiving. This is my father. Even in his Aramaic, he spoke the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic, right? And it starts off with abun washmea, nitka deshishma. Abun is a word of endearment. It's like in a term of like papa. So like Christ had this very intimate, very moving devotional experience of the father. And I believe he parodied the God of the Hebrew Bible. I don't think he believed in the God of the Hebrew Bible, even though he was Jewish. And he, you can tell from some of the things he said, because he said, what father, when their children ask them for a stone, would give them a serpent? He, oh, right? But when children ask them for bread, would give them a serpent. And that's what happened in the Hebrew Bible when the Israelites were in the wilderness that God sent serpents among them because he didn't like what they were doing. And they were crying for bread and they got this manna every day from heaven. So we wonder, and we do know Christ, according to what we read about him, if he was the actual figure, he was a rebel. He was not on board with the, the scribes, the Sadducees, the Pharisees. He was giving them grief every time you turn around. So he was clearly not on the typical Jewish thought. Even though he, of course, he was a Jewish person and he was aligned in some things, yet you can see some very clear distinctions of his thinking. And perhaps it was because he went to Egypt during his time when he was younger. Perhaps he was um, more of a Gnostic or more in uh, a strand that was not quite pure Judaism, or even though there are different flavors of these different paths, right? So Christ leads, Christ was the one that told me, no, that's not God in the Hebrew Bible. Then I went deeper. And the deeper I went, the more I began to see that the Bible is telling stories from ancient Sumeria. Sumer is the birthplace of human civilization, according to what we were told, right? Even according to what scientists say, this is not conjecture. It seemed as if the first humanoid beings were in Africa, and they came out of Africa, right? We're in Africa. And they say the first absolute human civilization built up, super advanced, sprung up in Sumer out of nowhere. How do we reconcile that? how to, and it's all very simple to reconcile when we do the research. So many years ago, 1800s or so, they wanted to see if the Bible was historically accurate. So they began digging in a lot of these places, the lands. There were different archeology span archeology, um, schools, universities would send archeologists to dig in these different places to prove the veracity of the Bible. And what they found was that, yes, the city of Jericho actually did exist. Yes, many of these things existed, yet they found so much more that they were not planning on because they found the uh, ancient texts, cuneiform tablets, 
that tell the Bible stories, except these tablets are far older than the Bible, by not just a couple of years, thousands of years. So we understand the Bible is retelling events that occurred long before, I mean, deep, deep, deep ancient antiquity, right? Well, when we start to study the nature of these texts, they're talking about beings that came here from the stars. They're talking about beings that came here from other planets, other star systems. These were not people that were from Earth. And because they had advanced technology, many people on the planet worshiped them as gods and they sort of propped themselves up as gods. And that is one of the reasons I believe that there was a war in Iraq because Sumer is modern day Iraq. And there are many, many, many secrets still. And, and even military people will tell you that we were moving things out like ancient, ancient things. They were moving these uh, ancient artifacts out of Iraq. Why would the military be taking artifacts out of Iraq? They told us they were there for something else. That's what they told us. And so we begin to understand there's a greater story here that's not 6,000 years old like the church told us. Now, the Bible never said 6,000 years old. The Bible never said any of these things. The church told us that 6,000 years old Adam and Eve were created. The church told us that God created the world in seven days and in six days on the seventh day, he rested. All that's in the Sumerian tablets and all of that is referring to the Anunnaki, also known as the Anuna. It just means from heaven, those who to earth from heaven came. That's all it means. And I don't find it too hard of a stretch of imagination because we've been having movies about extraterrestrials for years and years and years. Yet We know there are extraterrestrials. We've had Star Trek ever since I was a little girl. We've had Star Wars came out, I think, in the 80s. We've always, we're, we're, we're into astrology. Where did all that came from? It came from our deep past ancestors who came from a planet that was failing. And when they got here, they genetically modified a bipedal hominid that was already here that they found in the Absu. They called South Africa the Absu. And it was beings in, Af in Africa walking around doing things not as advanced. They weren't homo sapiens, sapiens like us. They were a homo erectus and they had burial rites and they had so, and they had cave paintings and they had some semblance of worship. So we knew that they were just not just regular apes. And so sure enough, when they came to do the gold mining, they came to dig gold so that they could repair their atmosphere. Their atmosphere was damaged. And so when they came to mine the gold, they bought an inferior race here to mine the gold, to do all this heavy lifting called the Ijiji. So there were the Anuna, the big gods, I guess you could say, and then kind of like the lesser gods, like a worker race of beings. And they worked them hard for thousands of years, according to the tablets. They were working mining that gold for thousands of years, hard back breaking labor work and they revolted there was a rebellion they said we're not doing it anymore and the sky council the big gods now none of these beings are gods i'm talking about how they were referred to so the big gods they had a sky council meeting because they had a council that would meet and the council is spoken of in psalm 84 1 if we read it it said god rules among the council among the gods it says it right in our Bible. So if we are really reading the Bible, the Bible is telling us all of it. That's why I love the Bible. It's not a religious text. It's telling us the history of humanity and it's telling us about our origins in a cryptic way because it's been reworked so many times. Yet the it's still there. So they had a Sky Council meeting. And in the meeting, they said, wow, we need something, some worker race that can take the place of, you know, the Ijiji because the mother goddess said, yeah, it, it's it's too much work and they've been working for too long. They should have, uh, well, she agreed with them. And they started talking about maybe we need some kind of being that can do the work because when they got here, there weren't people. 
right? There were no people here. And one of them said, I've seen something. I've seen a being like this. We've seen them. They're running around like in Africa. They're running around. We've seen them. Okay, well, let's go grab them, cage them up. But they're not quote unquote of the highest intelligence to take the instructions to do exactly what we want them to do and to use these precise tools and the technology that they bought here. So we need a being that's going to be a little more advanced than this being. And they try to mate, you know, genetically manipulate their own genes, DNA, with this hominid's DNA. And it didn't work at first. They had a few mishaps. They had one where the legs were going backwards. They had one that couldn't hold back his urine. They had one. It, it was a few iterations. This is all written out in the in the cuneiform text, in the Sumerian stories, Akkadian, Babylonian, Assyrian. Well, eventually they said, okay, this is what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to take one of ours and kill one of ours, get the blood and mud. This is where you get the God formed Adam out of the clay. And we're going to have to make it. And that's what they did. They did a merge of their own DNA. So we are children of the stars as well. What the DNA of the hominid that was here, Homo erectus, it was erect. It wasn't like a monkey or a chimpanzee just swinging on his, you know. It had customs. It had family groups. It had, like we said, some kind of spiritual artistic understanding. Probably if it had kept evolving another million years, if evolution is true, it might have got to us eventually. Yet, even biologists say that we had a huge evolutionary leap very quickly that's inexplicable about 200,000 years ago. What happened? Because it should have took millions of years for us to go from what they found in Africa to what we are now. But how do we just jump here? And how did we just jump from being horse and buggy to going to rocket ships? How are we so advanced and so fast, right? And doing all these things so fast. It, it should take millions of years for all this. Well, when they did the genetic mo modification, uh, it worked. And they put the embryo, what they had created, in one of the Anunnaki. And she bore the baby and it worked. So then she called more midwives. I guess you could call them surrogates. They had them pregnant, but there was only six of them. And they had to carry the baby for nine months. And they were like, well, this will take forever if we keep Letting these six keep having these babies. Some stories is six, sometimes some stories is seven. If we keep having them have a baby every year, this will take forever to get enough of the workforce in order to do all this work we need done. And so Inky, who is a great mastermind, master scientist, who was sort of the brains of the operation, he decided that he was going to give the Adamu, that's what they called it, the Adamu, Adam the Adamu. He was going to give the Adamu the ability to reproduce. Now, he did not check with the Sky Council about this because they didn't want the humans, you know, this Adamu to be able to reproduce. So he they made a, a woman and they made it so that the two of them could get together and reproduce in a garden. And they did have Eden. They called it E-D-I-N. So the Bible is telling us all of this. And it was outdoors. It was beautiful. And it had animals. And it had fruit and all of that. And uh, it worked. They started reproducing. And then when they started reproducing, the women were very beautiful. Because, you know, the master scientist, he made a beautiful counterpart. To, just like they probably had beautiful counterparts, too, in their race. And so, and so you could tell that the genealogy, that the, the gene pool is mateable because we could blend with theirs, right? Well, after the women started being, you know, looking very beautiful, very voluptuous, all of this, some of the An Anunnaki thought that they were beautiful and some of their children thought that they were beautiful. So there you get the story of the fallen angels or the 200 watchers, as Enoch calls them, deciding we're going to go take these women and have wives. 
And so some of the sons of the greater gods and even some of the quote unquote greater gods like Enki was having sex with this beautiful women. They called her the Eve, the, the Adamu and the Eve, right? So I having sex with them. And of course, the offspring were just monstrous. They were huge. Some of the women died in childbirth because babies were so huge. When they grew, they were giants. They were giants. They say, you know, between maybe 18 and 30 feet tall. That's how huge they were. And naturally, this is a, a, a natural, you know, a pairing. And so they did not view humans. You know how the Bible says that they went into the land of Anak? Anak is like the Anakim. And we were like grasshoppers in their eyes because the people were so little and these big giants. The Bible talks about giants, even Goliath, right? Yeah, there were giants. These giants were picking off the humans. They were killing the humans. Some of them were eating the humans. They loved blood. They were bloodthirsty. They were warring. It was a mess. It was a mess. And the ones who took the wives started teaching the wives witchcraft, spellcrafting, herbs, incantations, astrology, makeup. It says that they taught them colors, how to mix hues and create lipstick, makeup, eyeshadow, all of that. They taught them uh, metallurgy, how to get metals out of the ground, how to smelt copper, make weapons, make tools. They were teaching them all these things and the Anunnaki were like, oh, this has gotten out of control. This has gotten out of control, so we need to um, we need to thin the herd. And so they knew that there was going to be this very cataclysmic event because either their planet or a planet was going to be coming very close to Earth and it was going to melt the polar ice caps and there was going to be a flood. And that would wipe out. And the Bible tells us this, right? And it was going to wipe out a lot of these giants and, and, and they were like, these humans have gotten out of control. We need to just kill them. This was a bad experiment. That's what the Sky Council was saying because it just, and they were proliferating, proliferating, proliferating. So there's humans everywhere. It's it's giants. It's a mess. And sure enough, the flood came and Inky felt so bad that he told one of his dearest, it could have been one of his sons, one of his own sons, uh, named, in one story, he's named Utnapishtim. In another story, he's named Atrahasis. In the Bible, he is named Noah. And he told Noah, this Noah story is way older than what the Bible says. And he told against, he went against, because this was going to be a surprise obliteration. Don't tell the humans, because then they'll want to get on our spaceships. And they got on their spaceships and hovered while the disaster happened. And we have evidence of this on the planet because they say that in 12,000, about 12,500 years ago, the polar ice caps melted and there was great flooding all over the earth. That They call that the Younger Dryas. So we know that these events actually did take place. And so uh, he went to Utnapishtim and he told them, listen, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but he conveyed the information to him. It's going to be a disaster. You need to create a boat and create a submergible and you need to seal it with pitch which they had taught them how to make pitch like a tar to seal and it was more like a submers a submersible like almost like a submarine but still made of wood and things like that he taught him told him how to make it he said you need to make it and you need to get in it you and your family and a couple of livestock not like two penguins and two wasps and two mosquitoes and two snakes and two elephants and two lions like that's a children's fate. They took genetic material. The, the flood didn't wipe out everything that was on the planet. People were still living, right? And he took genetic material. And of course, the Anunnaki had genetic material too because they were tampering with animals and humans and all of that. And so they had the genetics of these. They didn't have the actual individual pairings of every of two goats and two sheep. I mean, this is ridiculous to think that all of these things can go on one boat. Hot, two water buffalo and two giraffes and two, I mean, it's a nice children's story. It's not facts. And so 
uh, he did that. And he said, you're going to know that the flood is coming because they had instruments of being able to determine the skies and the moon and all of these cosmic events, which affect the earth. And the humans didn't. So that's why he's telling them this. And so he told them, you're going to know because all of us are going to lift up. And we're not going to be in the flood. And he was like, oh, okay. And then that's how you know to get in that boat and go because the water is about to come. And sure enough, he did that, him and his family, and they survived. And then the waters broke loose. The polar ice caps melted. It was very violent on the planet. We have evidence of this all over the planet, different places um, where it was flooded. And people did survive, yet it was a great cataclysm. It wasn't an extinction level event because it didn't wipe out all planet Earth because else we wouldn't be here. Yet it was very catastrophic. So, wow, there's so much that you just said here. <laughs> Is this wild sounding? I mean, I, I understand. You know, it's, it's I've heard this before, not yeah. in the way you broke it down because this oh. is the first time I've heard someone break it down and talk about the ancient texts that talk about the story but then draw the equivalent of the story in the bible right like connect the dots this is the first time i've heard someone do that so i was kind of like lost in your words for a second so i have heard about the anunnaki's and them you know potentially seeding the planet i don't know if they seeded the planet with all the different races but i know that they had a um i've heard that they played a part in seeding the planet for for mining gold for their planet for the atmosphere for their planet so i've heard that part but e every time i hear it I i'm still mind blown at the possibility of that actually being the true history of our origins as a species on this planet compared to the idea of the one true source kind of coming down and you know creating us and i just remember thinking, you know, to your point about the the God in the Old Testament is different from the God in the New Testament. People say that all the time. The God in the Old Testament um, seems to be more jealous, more vengeful, um, more quick to like take action that is is violent, whereas the God in the New Testament, and I think this is the God that Jesus refers to a lot as being loving and unconditional and all of that stuff. So, before I even get into is the real God in the Bible or is it only in the Bible when Jesus mentions God, I want to make sure I fully understand, right? So when we talk about seeding the planet, so essentially we all have like a soul, we all have a spirit, right? The Anunnaki's didn't create our spirit and soul. Like if they were the ones that seeded this planet, are we kind of trying to say that they created the shells that we're in as souls or spirit beings? Like, what is the extent of the creation? That's what I'm I'm trying to understand, if that makes any sense. Oh, that's an excellent question. It wasn't, um, they couldn't create from nothing, right? Because they're not gods. They're just an advanced civilization. And there were many of them, different ones, and some of them were warring with each other. So they couldn't create something from nothing. Like they didn't take dirt and make a human being, like the Bible tells us. Yet the Bible is telling us that it they did have dirt. Dirt was involved. And that is in the ancient texts as well, that they took mud and they took blood and genetic material from one of their own that they had slain for the purpose of creating genetic manipulation, very much like we would do today with in vitro fertilization. We're not creating anything that wasn't already here. We can breed roses, we can breed dogs. We're just putting this thing with this thing together, but this thing already existed and this thing already existed, right? So they didn't create anything. It was all already here. Yet, they knew science, science that we still haven't discovered. And they knew genes. They knew the genome. Now, we didn't map the human genome until I think maybe 20 or 30 years ago. We just recently mapped the human genome. They had already mapped the human genome. Now that we have mapped the human genome, we understand DNA. And we also understand that you can get certain features in your baby if you want to by the ge genetic manipulation. 
So people are now having designer babies. Like, you know, I think Kim Kardashian or one of them, they had like a baby that they wanted to have blue eyes or they wanted to have brown eyes. We can do that. We can do surrogacy. We can take a human embryo and implant it in a woman that that egg does not belong to. So we can do all the things that they did. We're doing it now, yet they did it hundreds of thousands of years ago because supposedly they landed here probably about 450,000 years ago. It's a long time ago. And they were extremely long-lived. That's why people called them immortal. They weren't immortal, yet they were extremely long-lived. And I believe they were long-lived because their planet is so far from the sun. It takes one char, and they say 30, one char is 3,600 years for their planet to orbit the sun. Whereas we're whipping around the sun, you know, every 365 days. We're zooming around the sun, but they go like way out there. And even, and it makes sense because even astronomers have said that there could be a planet X because there is something impacting gravitationally the rest of the planets in the solar system. Maybe that's their planet. Nibiru is what it's called, right? So I don't think any of it is very strange when we think about it because we're doing all the things that they did. So no, they're not creators. The divine already had provided their world, the, the beings that were here, the beings that were here, if evolution is a fact, I don't know if it is or not, maybe in 2 million years, that being that was in Africa would have turned into us. Yet something happened 200,000 years ago that we popped onto the scene like this, not hairy. And it talks about that in the text, that the being that was running around was hairy and the one they made had smooth skin like them. Let us make them like us in our image. We're not going to make them to look like these hairy beasts. We want them to be refined like us with no hair on our skin. Let us make men in our image. And that's what they did. They made us more like them. God never said that. God never said, let us make men in our own image. And we can tell that God never said that because in the Hebrew, in the original Hebrew, it says, God's Elohim is plural. So it means gods or powerful ones or mighty ones. That's what it actually means. It doesn't mean God. It was whitewashed later on to mean, let's just make it all God. Let's make Yahweh God. Let's make El Elyon God. Let's make Adonai God. Let These were all different An 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 Anunnaki. El Shaddai was an Anunnaki. That was the... Uh, El Shaddai means the L of the mountain or the L of the step, L of the plains. El Shaddai is his own Anunnaki. You know, it makes me think about when people are praying and they're calling on these names. I've heard people say El Shaddai, um, Elohim, Yahweh, or Jehovah, all like these different names that are supposed to imitate God. But if, if what if what you're saying is true, then people are potentially calling on the names of aliens or tapping into an energy source that's not the, the God that they think they're talking about. Yeah, they're not talking to the God source of the universe. No, no, they're not. Which, I, and I'll add this other piece to it. Humans are so powerful and our consciousness is so powerful that if all of us collectively, there's been billions of people that think the name El Shaddai has power, we made it so. It does have power. We made Adonai have power. We gave it that power. We made Yahweh powerful. We said he's God. All of us said he's God. Even if he's not, that's what we believe. So it doesn't even matter it matters more the energy that we put behind it. So if, if they feel like they're tapping into the one true source, then that's what they're tapping into when they say that. That's name. exactly right. That's right. Okay. And they're getting the result because they can tell you, I prayed to El Shaddai and I got healed. And I, I know that happens because 
here's the real bottom line of it. Your mind does it all. It's whatever you believe in your mind. The universe is mental. That's the first hermetic principle. The very first one. Wow. So is the source mentioned in the Bible at all? It, when Jesus talks about the source, who is Jesus talking about? When Jesus talks about his father, who is Jesus referring to? Well, this this now leads into a whole nother part because the, the first part of the Bible is not about God at all. It's about aliens, right? And, and I won't call them aliens because they're our ancestors, ex extraterrestrial ancestors, star travelers. The second half of the Bible is a piece of Roman propaganda. And I know this is going to sound really, really, really out there. We don't know if Jesus really said the things that he said in the Bible. And even Bible scholars will tell you that. So we don't know. What I do know about the New Testament is that the New Testament is heavily edited by Romans. And we have proof of that. And the Flavians, who were the emperors that were uh, the dynasty that were responsible for the felling of the Jerusalem temple, who destroyed the Jerusalem temple at 70 CE, the Flavians had a big problem on their hands. So, so the New Testament is political. That's still not about God. Now, even if Jesus was really mentioning, even if the, the quotes that we have about Jesus mentioning God are in there, great. That's not what the New Testament is about. The New Testament is created to get people to believe something. So it's not about God. What was the New Testament get created to make us believe? The Romans wanted the New Testament circulating, and it wasn't even the New Testament then. It, it didn't become the New Testament until many years later. The Romans needed cohesion in the empire because they just create they just created a, a a travesty. They destroyed the Jerusalem temple. It was on fire. And they took the gold out and they're marching, you know, triumphant. We killed the Jews because the Jews were always uprising because it was like the Romans had a boot on the neck of the Jewish people. Right. And so, of course, you're going to uprise if you're being a, a boot is on your neck. You're definitely going to uprise. And so there were a lot of uprisings. And, and, the, and, the, and the Roman Empire was vast. It went all the way from like. Rome, Italy, all the way across parts of northern Egypt, you know, Alexandria, where that is, all the way over to like Iraq, Turkey, all of that. This is a huge, vast area for them, Jerusalem, Galilee, all of that. This is a huge, vast area for them to police. And they have no communication. They have no internet. So what do they have? To, and they can't be around all the time. They don't, even with all their legions, they can't be everywhere in the entire Roman Empire at all times to keep the peace. So what did they do? They they resorted to brutality. They would have a battalion. They would hear of an uprising through their circuitry of, of communication. And they would hear of an uprising. And they would send a battalion to crush the uprising in the most horrific way. And they would line up crosses and crucifix, sometimes crucify a thousand people. Horribly. People are hanging up there suffering for it takes a very long time to die by crucifixion that's why when they ask for jesus body uh supposedly joseph of arimathea when he asked for jesus body Pilate said he's dead already like it's only been a few hours how can he be dead already and they were like no he's dead and they took the spear and blood and water came out right that he was hanging there and he was, he was gone he had given up the ghost he was like i'm not hanging out here for no hours and hours and hours i'm out of here <laughs> I did what I need to do for these humans. It's over, right? So he left. He just knew how to rise up out of his body. And so, and there's a lot of stories about that that are just so fascinating and amazing. But anyway, the bottom line is that when they did all of what they were doing, destroyed the Jerusalem temple, they took slaves to Jewish people because everyone that the Romans would conquer 
back in those days, it was normal. You take slaves, you conquer this country, you enslave their people, you bring them back in chains. They now work for you. You own them. You take their language, you take their history or whatever. And you, you know, the only ones that didn't really stamp out people's religion was more like the Persians. They kind of let people kind of have their religion. But most of those other if you were invaded by like the Assyrians or something like that, they were super bloodthirsty and super, you know, violent. You probably are not going to have any tie to your homeland. They're going to cut off the language. They're going to cut off the religion, your worship. Now you worship our gods. So the Romans had a big problem. They had all these slaves. These Jewish people are uprising every time you turn around. They're rising up, slitting throats, all of that. So what's better than violence and a boot on people's neck and terror and control a story a story is more powerful than all of that so they knew that they would have to do psychological warfare to keep these why does the bible talk so much about slaves obey your masters even if you, it literally says it in the Bible, even if your master is cruel, obey your master as unto the Lord. That's all Roman propaganda to spread this idea of this Christian thing and get people on side with Rome and let's cut out all of these uprisings and whatnot. They, it was just, they had a big problem on their hands. And they, they use psychological warfare. And this is really detailed in great detail. I wouldn't be saying this flippantly without having, having done research. I can recommend an excellent book that details this from decades of research. It's called Creating Christianity. Our Roman emperors, I think, fabricated the religion of Christianity or something. It, it's it's damning the way that they, they have the facts. They have the receipts. So the second half of the Bible is political and the first half of the Bible is extraterrestrial. Mm. You know, speaking of control and how you just broke that down, you know, a lot of people say that religion is, you know, kind of focusing on Christianity because of this conversation, that Christianity is used as a way to control people, right? To have people fall in line. They talk about sin, eternal damnation, and seeking salvation so that we can go to the promised land or eventually find our way to heaven. So I want to talk about that, right? Because one of the biggest stories in the Bible that sort of is a jump off point for this whole notion of sin and being sinners and needing to repent and, and follow the scriptures and follow the rules of the Bible starts from the book of Genesis with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, right? And I think that you said the Garden of Eden was more of a trap. So what is the real story of the Garden of Eden? I know that you talked about it as it pertains to the Anunnaki's in kind of creating um, and seeding this planet, but why did you say the Garden of Eden was more of a trap? And, and what was the real story behind, quote unquote, the serpent um, trying to get Eve to disobey God? Yes. Well, the Garden of Eden, this is this where the Bible story comes from, is that it was an outdoor breeding ground. It was a genetic library, a, a genetic, it was a laboratory. It was an outdoor genetic laboratory for breeding Adamus and Eves. There was more than one Adam. It was several couples breeding because what we know from genetics, and that's why I love a multi a multiple, a multidisciplinary approach to this, because if we look at weather, if we look at archaeology, if we look at cosmic events, if we look at language, if we look at ancient texts, if we look at our own biology, there are a lot of anomalies there that are not explained by the mainstream story. So the mainstream story is not actual. It's not factual. There has to be more to it. And this makes perfect sense. All the puzzle pieces fit together when you look at it. So the Garden of Eden was an outdoor breeding laboratory, we could say, for Adam and Eve. They couldn't leave. So you know how in the Bible they say that there were cherubs guarding the garden? There were guards, Anunnaki God, guards, that they couldn't go out just be in the wild, right? So they were in there breeding or being bred 
And one day, Inky tells Eve, one of the women in there, you are not really in a paradise. This really kind of is a prison. Now, what made him tell her the truth? I don't know his motive. He told her the truth and she, Adam wasn't there. Adam was working. Adam was somewhere else. And he said, y'all are being bred. Y'all are that. And I think Inky had a soft spot for humans because he was the master scientist that did all of this genetic. It was like his creation. Like, wow, look at my creation. Look what happened. You know, in Lil, he was like, he winds up being like the Jehovah, the evil God of the Bible, or the bad brother in all the stories, the evil brother in all the stories. In Lil was like, kill them all. We'll make more. <laughs> you know, he's that kind of being, you know? And Inky was kind of like, maybe let's not kill them, so forth and so on. And he wanted to give them more powers and abilities than the Sky Council agreed to. The Sky Council wanted workers. We need worker bees that can take instructions and get this gold out and do this hard force labor and don't argue with us and don't uprise. And so Inky was giving them things that he probably shouldn't have, just like he told Utnapishtim, a flood is coming. He did things that were like, he's a friend of humanity. Enlil, Enlil is not a friend of humanity. And we still have that going on today. There are dark forces that are not friends of humanity. And there are the white hat brigade, the forces of the light that are for humanity in ascension. That's where I'm, I'm on the white hat brigade, right? So he, Inky, represents the serpent. So in later stories, it got rehashed that the serpent spoke to Eve and told her to eat of the tree. No, supposedly, Inky gave her a tool, supposedly made from a tree, that could be used either to farm with or to kill with. He was introducing her to something that was beyond tree of, of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life symbols, right? That we still have to this day. He was enlightening her. The Bible flipped it that the serpent was the evil one. Now we're not the only ones who have asked what actually happened in the Garden of Eden because if we go to the Jewish texts, the Midrash, which are more like stories and, you know, uh, sort of like in the an elaboration on what we actually have in the Pentateuch or the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. The Midrash says that Eve was beguiled. The serpent was somehow able to have sex because he didn't crawl on his belly because they're trying to make sense of what's in the Bible and that he had sex with her. And Cain was the offspring. Now that's what's in the Jewish, some of the Midrash, which are more like stories, right? Not saying it's fact. Then you go to the Gnostics. So you got to look at these different, what are these different groups of people saying? Everyone, all of these groups of people, including some Christians that believe in the serpent seed doctrine. It's an actual Christian doctrine. It's not a mainstream Christian doctrine. Yet a lot of Christians hold the belief that Cain is not the son of Adam. Cain is the seed of the serpent, which is why he was evil and why he killed his brother. The Gnostics, when we went and got the, well, I wasn't there, not we, but when the Nag Hammadi library was pulled out, right, of those caves in Egypt and the supposedly a group called the Gnostics. We just kind of call them the Gnostics because they were about Gnosis, but they would not have called themselves Gnostics. It's just a word we use, a terminology for groups of people. And it could be different groups of people with varying beliefs. Even some of the Essenes were there, Gnostics. Well, in the Nag Hammadi library, they have a whole different take on it. It's completely reversed. The serpent was the liberator and the God who made these bodies, these human bodies, was the uh, archon, the demiurge, who seeks to entrap the human spirit in a body. 
like our true divine spark is trapped in a body. And the Demiurge did that, not God. And the one that was the liberator to tell them, hey, y'all are trapped. This is a trap. Get out of here. Was the true helper of humanity, the liberator. And that would have been Inky with the serp as the serpent. You know, it's so interesting because I recently was, you know, studying the Bible. I'm trying to, you know, study a lot of these texts for myself and get an understanding um, and, and kind of like arrive at my own understanding or what resonates with me. And the part of, you know, God being upset with Eve from eating from the tree of knowledge or telling them they can't eat from the tree of knowledge, the word knowledge there made me pause. And I was like, why would God be pissed off that they ate from the fruit of knowledge? I mean, from the tree of knowledge, why is knowledge off limits? So that, that was a, a cause, um, for pause or cause of concern. I don't want to say concern because that sounds dramatic, but it, it made me pause. That line made me pause. And I was like, what is wrong with knowledge? Isn't that, isn't knowledge power? Like when you know your eyes are open, you see what the truth is. So to me, I'm like, why wouldn't God want them to know the truth? Right. It, it makes you like look at the story differently. And it's interesting that we're having this conversation, right? Because we're not taught to study the Bible in in a way where we can question things. And I'm really big on questioning. I don't like to tell people what to believe. I'm still figuring out what I believe. I'm still on a on a journey. I have a ferocious appetite for I have a ferocious sense of curiosity. I don't even know if I'm you know putting those words in the right order, but it's just fascinating that a lot of people aren't taught to question or look deeper into these things. So I really appreciate how you're able to break this down and pull from different texts and kind of map out the the line across each of these texts, because it's very illuminating for me because I'm like, oh, okay, that, that seem that, that makes sense. Right. Because a lot of times, like to your point too, where like, you know, they talk about the human evolution and you see like apes or, you know, you see apes and then eventually you see a human <laughs> being. And when you look at the time frame and how we quote unquote evolved, and then you look at the time frame other animals evolved, I'm like, what happened? Like, it's so short. Like, how did we go from that to that in such a short period of time? Right. And, you know, the scientific community would be like, well, that's just how it is. Like they might not necessarily claim that it's God. Like I would just say, like, there was some sort of divine intervention, God, if you want to call it, that probably expedited the process. Right. But like there's so much separation with a lot of these things that like we have so many clues and it's interesting, even though more people are having these conversations, like nobody's trying to figure it out or put the pieces together. Right. So I'm just trying to say that I appreciate this conversation in a very long winded way. Um, and it makes me think like, now that we're having these conversations more, right. Why do you think more people are waking up or entertaining these conversations in a real way right like I know that you mentioned a couple of times like this probably sounds crazy right and even when people are digging deeper into these things they probably feel a little crazy for like potentially entertaining such a thought but it's still happening and, and why do you think that is at this period of time the Mayans foretold it they said that at the end of the long count, they didn't say it was the end of the world. They said it was the end of the long count, 2012, right? Or, or 2012. They said that we would either self-destruct or we would go, humanity as a race, would go into a great awakening. So we did self-destruct. We chose to ascend. We chose to awaken to our true nature. And if the story we have been told about a God you know, right in the Bible in Genesis, it says, we can tell that there's something amiss with the Adam and Eve story, if it's to mean what they told us, because doesn't it say that after they ate and then Adam ate, she told Adam, hey, and look what they told me and, you know, da, da, da. 
doesn't it say God was walking in the garden at the breezy part of the day? I always thought that was odd. God is walking in the garden. Well, if he's an AET, of course he's walking in the garden. Makes perfect sense. But if he's God, how does God even walk? You're the God of the entire universe. But how are you walking in a garden at the breezy part of the day? Like, this is your habit. Like every day, you just walk through the garden when it's breezy. No, that can't be like the all God. Who's watching heaven while you're down here walking around on the ground? No. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. That, that was another part that confused me as a child because if God is all knowing, then wouldn't he have known that they would have eaten from the tree of knowledge, but he was still so pissed off by it. So there's just a couple of things there. And, you know, people might hear this conversation and think, oh, well, they're trying to uh, discredit the Bible or say the Bible is not a holy book. That's not what we're saying. I think we're just calling attention to the fact that there are other things going on here that we might be entertaining from a place of, oh, this is religion and we might use it to back certain beliefs in certain ways that we're living our lives, but it's not actually what was intended or it's it's not the right, potentially not the most accurate understanding of of the reality of how things played out and what was actually written in the Bible. That's what we're trying to draw attention to, not necessarily discredit the Bible or say the Bible is not a holy book. So I just want to put that disclaimer out there for anyone. Um, you know, I feel like we just scratched the surface. <laughs> <laughs> like we just scratched the surface. And if you let me keep going, I have a thousand more questions for you, <laughs> but I want to kind of, you know, wrap it up here. Cause I have had the best conversation with you. Yeah. Um, I have one final question before we like do the final wrap up question. And I'm just curious to know from your perspective, right? We all have our own specific path. Like you said at the beginning of our conversation that sometimes when we go into religion and spirituality, it's it's not a one size fits all. Like sometimes it has to do with our ancestry and what we're being called to in this lifetime and what we actually resonate with, what our spirit, our, our soul resonates with. Um, but, you know, a lot of times people think it's just one path, right? So, for example, people who have decided to dabble into the occult or quote unquote new age, a lot of people, the same way you had an experience of, of living religion, people have had an experience of, of living, leaving um, witchcraft or quote unquote new age practices and running back to the church and denouncing everything about it and just saying like it was evil, I didn't know what I was doing and all of that stuff. I'm always curious to ask people like you do you have any theories as to why people who dabble into witchcraft or the occult or new age practices find themselves running back to the church i can't really speak for what's happening in their consciousness i can only say that what it appears could be happening is unhealed you know we we have to do our work we have to do our work and whether you're a witch or whether you're a Christian doesn't make you good or evil. There are witches like me that have taken a vow of harmlessness and we're not out to harm anybody. There are Christians that would pay, pick up a gun or a knife and kill people. We have the Inquisition, we have the Crusades to know that it can be pretty bloody. So it's not a matter of whether you're a Christian or witch or what you are. It's a matter of in here. what are you in here? If you're a scoundrel, you're a scoundrel. You're a scoundrel as a witch and you're a scoundrel as a Christian. It's not a matter of where people are and it, it is an opportunity for us to heal because if we think that we can leave witchcraft and go to Christianity and that's going to be our saving grace, it's not a religion can't save anyone. You got to save yourself. By how? By choosing to ascend your consciousness, choosing to come into oneness. You've got to choose it in here. No religion can give you that. No holy book can give you that. And even people that have these amazing experiences in church, which I have had amazing experiences in church, what seems to escape awareness of 
is that you are having that experience. The church is not having that experience. You were in the church and you, the choir was going, it was amazing. You were in this high, it's amazing. And you had this experience of maybe ecstasy or bliss or a breakthrough or healing in the body. You did that. Your consciousness did that. The church was a catalyst. The church was a trigger. But it doesn't mean that because you got healed of something in the church that everything the church says is right. It doesn't mean that your experience does not validate the doctrine and dogma of the church, even though your experience is valid. It does not validate everything the church does. And people seem to have a difficult time differentiating and making the distinction between I'm having this experience. I could just as well have this experience in an Islamic box. I could have this experience dancing under the full moon with witches at night. I could have this experience swimming in the ocean. Bliss, ecstasy, joy, elation, self-healing. That's available to everyone. It's not living in the church. It's living in you. So that's what my work is about. Awakening us to our true powers. Mm. You are the magic. Not the building, not the choir, not the music. You are the magic and you've got to come or we have the opportunity to come into such self-mastery that we can trigger ourselves. I can trigger myself into a state of bliss, just like if I was in church with the choir and, oh, yes, I know how to do that within myself for myself. And that's what we all have the ability to do. Your consciousness is your responsibility, not the church's. I like that. Your consciousness is your responsibility. Thank you so much, Kaisi. I have to ask you one final question, and that is, have you shifted in perspective on anything lately? And it could be as lighthearted as you want it to be or as deep as you want it to be. Yes, I have shifted on acai bowls that I do not like acai blended with banana. I like straight up acai. I have definitely shifted on that because before I would eat the acai blended with other things, I don't want blended acai anymore. I've shifted to straight up. Give me the straight up goods. <laughs> I love it. I used to eat acai bowls as well, but I was like, these are pretty sweet. Like they're too sweet for me, especially okay. in the morning. That's when I would usually eat those bowls. So that's funny. Thank you so much um, for stopping by Shifting Dimensions. Where can people find you if they want to listen to more of what you have to say on these topics if they want to work with you or just check you out in general. So ValerieLove.com and there you're going to see all the retreats that I lead all over the world to Egypt and Bali and Thailand and Peru and Sedona and Salem and New Orleans and all of the places. You'll see that at ValerieLove.com as well as my books, author of 25 books, as you mentioned at the beginning of the conversation. And then you'll see everything Christian Witches at ChristianWitches.com. Those who are coming out of Christianity or still want to keep Christianity in their walk as a witch, we understand that very well. And we're able to help people who have Christ consciousness, a background in Christianity, or still currently Christians to infuse their life with magic. Thank you so much for stopping by Shifting Dimensions. Thank you so much, Jermaine.